Again, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for having me here. My name is Ned Andre. I'm with uh, here. Everybody, hold up your hand like this. Put up a fist and go. Community collaboration on climate change. Community collaboration, climate change. It's pretty easy if you remember C4. Okay. And you can see it here. Community collaboration on climate change. And I'm not the only C4 member in the house. I see Cynthia. Um, Bailey is one of our community ambassadors. Are there any other C4 folk in the house? Okay, so thank you for joining us here. Um, we're really excited about the invitation. Um, we, I'm going to start with a brief overview. I got 10 slide decks I could go through, and all of them have all jumbled different things, but you can get to pretty much everything we want to get to. Um, but before we start, I would like to do a quick land acknowledgement, if you don't mind. Um, I should have pulled that up ahead of time. Give me just one uh, quick second. Uh, so, I can pull it from. I just got a uh, little bit of software stuff changed here, so give me just a second. Uh, there we go. You guys can all see what I'm doing here, I'm sure. <laughs> You're way faster than I am. <laughs> so, I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement simply because C4 oops, begins every meeting with a land acknowledgement. And I'll tell you why we do that. Get where I want to be in a moment. There we go. Okay. We start here because our project, the Community Collaboration on Climate Change, is centered in equity for the BIPOC community. It's a BIPOC organization, Black, Indigenous, People of Color, Latinos. Asians, um, you know, Aborigines, anybody that's in that group. And then actually we've expanded, and now C4 actually includes youth, the elderly, the disabled, the unhoused. We're really trying to pull in anybody who's been marginalized and, and, and cast to the side. But we recognize a special affinity with the Native American people, so we always begin with this land acknowledgement. It's not quite on the screen for you guys there. Sorry. So we start by saying, we want to acknowledge that we are here, this very church, we are here on the beautiful ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe people, the people of the three fires, the Ojibwa, Odawa, and Badawatomi. We recognize the sovereignty of Michigan's indigenous nations and historic communities, both those who live here now and those who were forcibly removed from their homeland. We want to express gratitude and appreciation to the indigenous people across this continent who have been living and caring for this land from time immemorial, who are still here and will always continue to be present in this place. And we start with that land acknowledgement because climate change is really impacting <coughs> ecosystems, biomes, you know, uh, the environment that we live in. If you go back historically when the United States was colonized, the colonists came to the Americas and said, Look at this Garden of Eden. It's rich and fecund, and it's such a bountiful blessing in every regard. Look what God's good hand has done. And they were completely unaware that for millennia, the Native American people had been shepherding the land, using natural practices, using controlled burns. Um, if you have oak trees in your neighborhood in Michigan, it's, it's most likely that those were brought here by Native Americans because 1,200 years ago, the oaks weren't this far north. 
and it was the Native Americans. So even here in Michigan, this, this incredible hardwood forest that we find was managed by the natives. And the home you live in, if you live in the city of Grand Rapids, the home you live in, the lumber, you say, yeah, we got hardwood wood floors. Oh yeah, this is old, this is maple. These are the trees that were shepherded by the indigenous people. So we start there and we recognize their land. Um, the next thing I'd start with would be our community agreements for just a moment. C4 always begins with a set of community agreements because climate change can be controversial. It doesn't seem like it, but it, it can be very divisive. <laughs> so we start with a moment of silence, which we sort of did with the prayer and the um, candle there. And then we ask everybody to be authentic. Speak your truth without blame or judgment. Listen attentively with your ears, eyes, and hearts. Notice moments of discomfort and stay curious. Discomfort is okay. I don't like it, but it's okay. Be open to the experience and to each other. Why am I speaking? Speak first to understand, <coughs> then to be understood. Counter the inner I'm waiting for you to stop talking so I can explain to you why I need to listen, to understand. Um, we assume positive intent. Um, somebody may do something that you think, ah, oh, that wounded me, or that we're going to assume positive intent. We're all in different places with our knowledge base, cultural sensitivities, all of these different things. Uh, be open to all communication styles, an accent or poor grammar. Even the word poor is a judgment. An accent and grammar doesn't mean that the person doesn't add value. Uh, think about your, the impact of your words beyond intent. It's okay if you're tired. Climate justice work is long term. Real life keeps happening and can be distracting to staying present. And remember, C4, we center equity. So that every conversation you try to say, what is equitable? Man, there's so much even just in that statement there alone. Can anyone in the room define equity? If I ask 10 people, there's 10 different answers. That's a tough word to understand. But the way C4 defines equity is really that it's not about equality, it's not about fairness, it's about You've seen, the, you've seen the meme on the internet where there's three guys trying to watch a baseball game and there's a fence in front of them. There's a very short person and there's a middle-sized person and there's a very tall person. Equality would mean we're going to give them all boxes to stand on because they can't see. They get three of the same boxes and they get the tall guy box, the middle guy box, and they get the uh, short guy box. And if you watch the meme, the tall guy can see over the fence already. The middle guy, he was here and he really helped the middle guy. But the guy that got the, the short person, so it's not even tall enough to get them over the fence, they still can't see the game. Mm -hmm. So equality isn't always the answer. Equity says, what does this guy need? And it turned out the tall guy doesn't need a box. The middle guy needs a box of a certain height, and the short guy needed a box that was twice as tall as the other guy's box. Now he can see the ball game too. So that's kind of how we think about equity. It's not equality, it's how do you level the playing field for people that are behind? And, and get them what they need. So if they're disabled, can you build ramps so they can attend the mm -hmm. meeting? That's not, I don't need a ramp, maybe you don't need a ramp. But equity says, hey, get a ramp so that everybody can come into the meeting, just so that we have a level playing field. All right, let me jump into some of the uh, presentation then here. And uh, we start, I'll start here. Just a quick run through of what C4 is. We are the Community Collaboration on Climate Change, and it is a climate justice organization. Uh, it did start with a grant ask, so there was a group of people um, it started in academia, all the universities got together and said, what's the problem with climate change in Grand Rapids that we could solve? And they looked at the whole field, there are 85 agencies already working on climate change in Grand Rapids from the Sierra Club to the, um, all the big players, MEMIAC and U.S. Green Building Council, nation, national organization, state level organization, and even local nonprofit. But when you look into the ecosystem, they're all white-founded, white-funded, white-led, and then tend to hover over the black and brown communities, people that have in, um, inequities, and they hover in for a day, they serve a meal during Thanksgiving, glad to deal with your home, um, uh, hungry problem, and then they drift away. And so, see, uh, this, this academia said, hey, we, we got to do something a little different. And the solution was build an organization that's based on a BIPOC model, so you draw in all of the disadvantaged folks, and when they found that answer, everything went dormant. City of Grand Rapids started an Office of Sustainability office. And 
and then one person to run probably what would need a 50 million, 20 million uh, dollar budget, but they got a tiny little budget. And that person says, how can we solve this problem with Grand Rapids? Start searching through academia and say, hey, look, they've already got the answer. And they took the research and they applied it. And then they wrote a grant and they wrote to the Lanky Foundation who uh, awarded a $500,000 award. This is the largest award ever given by Wendy to a community-based organization. We're not a 501c3, we're not a, just a group of people who gathered together and said, hey, we want to make a difference. We got small contributions from consumers and from DTE as well. What are we trying to do? Well, a couple of things that C4 specifically, this lady here, she's one of our leadership team directors. We don't say board of directors, we don't have a board. We're not a 501c3 with a board. We're a community-based organization with a leadership team. And we've uh, planted Sign Aunt Jordan. We positioned her on the Grand Rapids uh, Community Master Plan Steering Committee. Uh, Grand Rapids is going through uh, a planning process. They're trying to put a 20-year plan together. These plans, they are very, follow very closely. And so if you don't get climate language <clears throat> into the plan, if you don't get climate justice issues into the plan, then we will be doing the people of the service. So we try to get that language into the planning process. Um, we've done a lot to connect with neighbors. So we went to Neighborhood Summit, if you've ever been downtown, to the yearly Neighborhood Summit. And we performed a play for people that tried, one of our main focuses is um, energy uh, equity, energy justice. There are a lot of people who don't even think about the electric bill, the gas bill, the water bill, but they turn on, the, they flip the switch and it's on, they turn the handle and it's on. There's this whole segment of society that are one paycheck away from having their electric turned off, having their gas turned off, having their water turned off. So we did three budgets. One of our leadership team directors had a really nice budget. This um, blended family had kind of a uh, social budget, and this individual had almost no budget at all. And so we just walked people through their energy burden of, okay, I've been redlined into the oldest housing stock in the city. I live in this house that was built in um, you know, 1910. Um, balloon construction, no insulation, uh, poor materials uh, in terms of those weatherization kind of stuff, single pane of glass. And these folks are paying 20 and 30% of their total income just to keep the lights on and the gas on in the winter. And then there's a lot of injustices in that. Um, it's almost worse in Grand Rapids, Michigan right now with the housing crisis. It's almost worse to have an eviction on your record than it is to have a felony on your record. So you have a felony on your record from seven years ago, and you've got good income, and you qualify and all this, they'll rent an apartment. But you have default one time on your, you know, you get evicted one time, and a landlord down the line says, I'm not going to deal with you. Come to dig in a little bit deeper, city ordinance says you have to keep the gas on. You can't rent an apartment without having the gas on. So the landlord says, if your gas or electric gets cut off, you have to notify me because they're going to call me a slumlord if that's not on. And if you can't keep it on, I have the right to evict you because um, you're required per the lease to have gas and electric on at all times. Mm -hmm. So people have to decide if I pay the rent, where do I keep the electric on? And if they decide to pay the rent and the electric goes off, they can be evicted. If they keep the electric and gas on and they don't pay the rent, they can be evicted. Mm -hmm. So there's this impossible burdens that have been placed on people. And so C4 is here to try to help. We do a lot of that through neighborhood associations. We do a lot of outreach there. So we've been to Martin Luther King, we've been to Noble, we've been to Boston Square, we've been to Cherry Hill, we've been to Heritage Hill, we've been to every neighborhood association and said, we want to reach out to the marginalized and disadvantaged people in your community. We want to be a connector, we want to show them there are resources. There are often programs that can help people pay their electric and gas and water bill, but there's nobody connecting them to those resources. They don't even know. And every year we read the report about, hey, there was a billion dollars left on the table of resources that nobody utilized. We can never figure out what we got. Them. We have to connect the people to these resources. Um, C4 had a lot of impact. I mean, just the idea of C4 alone. So this one I won't read this to you, but basically what happened was that once we made a presentation into the neighborhood association. Uh, there's a neighborhood here called the West Grand Neighborhood. And there was a person living in Walker, Michigan, 
right around in this area, they didn't have a neighborhood association, but they called their closest one, which is one in Grand Rapids. We just got the C4 um, presentation, and they're like, you need to, so this individual in Walker was saying, hey, the city of Walker planning to do um, a major uh, development, right? Uh, nope, I'm in the wrong spot, right in this area right here. Uh, I don't even know if I have it right on the map. No, it's up here, pardon me, it's right in this area, right in this area. 1131 by Grand River, beautiful, big field, and this neighbor calls and says, hey, they want to come in, they want to develop this 25 acres, they want to put in a big apartment complex to solve the housing crisis, they're going to make a bunch of money. All the neighbors walk their dogs and go down by this field, this trail through the field. They've counted 200 trees and a little brook that runs down to the river. And they're all distraught because the walkers are going to pave it all over. So all I did was say, based on what I learned, I'm no expert. I just sat down and started studying when I hired about had this contract. I said you should call Eagle, see if there's an environmental study that's been done. Ask him what's you know what's living there, what's growing there. And he said that's a great idea. Calls me back three weeks later and says, hey, there is a study, and there are certain kind of frogs and plants and flowers and different things, and it, it, it very likely is going to prevent anybody from building another housing complex on the river where you've now managed the stream in this 25 acres. So C4 is trying to do all these different things that will preserve the environment. The real heart of our program, though, is how do you do this work? We just mentioned at the beginning of the top of the hour that a lot of this work is already being done, but how do you bring the BIPOC community and the frontline community in? So C4, what we do is we contract C4 ambassadors, ordinary individuals that we've gone to every quadrant of the city, and we just find ordinary people. We give them a climate leadership program. Um, we teach them, train them, and equip them, and then we send them out into their own neighborhood to do hyper-local projects. So these individuals, DeAndre Jones, Leah Baker, Felicia Simmons, Robert Simmons, and Bedside of Valdivia, they came in as our first cohort, and then we um, did some work, we were all working. Um, we do have a real affinity to try to, to connect with the tribal community. So one of the things that we were working on is getting more Native American involvement. And then we found out that even the BIPOC community, when you bring black, indigenous, people of color together, we all still have a lot of colonization in our minds as well. And we have fear and mistrust of one another. Ordinarily, a black group works with a black issue, and Hispanic people are working on Hispanic issues. And then, but when you bring everybody together, and I say, let's, they say, let's work on this black issue. Well, no, let's work on this uh, Latin issue. No, we need to work on this Asian issue. <laughs> Now it forced us to really all take a step back and we had to build a lot of trust amongst each other. We had to find common issues. But we, uh, one of our common issues is the Grand River Bands of Ottawa Indians. They're still seeking tribal recognition. Um, there are 12 tribes in the state of Michigan that are recognized and they like to be, they have a treaty, they have this agreement from the United States federal government that says all the land where the Gerald R. Ford Museum, that whole stretch, that was all preserved as Indian country, they called it. And for a long time in this city, it was Indian country until the city over here on this uh, east side of the river got too big. And they said the best place to build more would be on the other side of the river. And then the, they ended up taking the land back from the natives. And even to this day, this tribe, they're not federally recognized based upon US law, this federal treaty. So we've been wading into that issue, trying to bring justice to that issue. Uh, other cities have seen what C4 has done, so we get sit other cities now, they found out about us, what we're doing, so we went up to the city of Rockford, we talked to their environmental committee, gave them a lot of input on what they could do. Um, this first cohort, uh, each ambassador brings certain skills to the table, and one of our ambassadors, Leah, she's, she's a horticulturist. It turns out she's a certified horticulturist, she taught us all how um, native plants work. We made seed bombs. I think Johnny Appleseed, we have a little bag of these little things. So just see a bare patch of ground, you scratch it, you drop it. And, and the next thing you know, Michigan native wildflowers are growing. But we set some ground rules. We're not throwing bombs. <laughs> Other property, parks, and things like that, or you know, right away along the stream or something like that. But just de developing this knowledge that even Kentucky bluegrass is an invasive species, and that it's not just an invasive species, but it's part of a colonized mind. And that when the founding fathers came across, 
those with great wealth and power, only someone with great wealth and power could, could say, hey, you see that five acre square? I'm going to clear that every tree, every living thing, except for grass. And I'm going to control it. I'm not going to let another weed grow because I have the money, the luxury, the workforce to take care of that lawn. And it became a standard of beauty. People thought what Jefferson and the other founding fathers had done was the most beautiful thing they had ever seen. It was different. It was new. Typically, there's all these different things growing. So when that becomes a standard of beauty, then uh, after World War II, when the GI Bill passes and the highways are built and the suburbs are developed, they write it in the local ordinance. You've got to have grass. And if you don't have grass, and if your grass is longer than 12 inches, <laughs> we'll give you a citation. And your other neighbors will go, hey, no bill, I see a couple of dandelions in your backyard the other day. So I'm going to look person <laughs> And that's how serious people take their law. And what C4 is saying, what, what the world is saying, what the climate crisis is saying, is not bringing in these indigenous species and killing all living things. Because to keep a grass, a lawn good, you need pesticide, insecticide, fungicide, herbicide. And then you need to cut it with a gas-powered mower every single Saturday. And you can kill every living thing except for grass. So we, these are the kind of psychological shifts that C4 works on. How do, you, um, how do you change people's hearts and minds? Um, then we picked up a second cohort of individuals, and that's where Cynthia came in. Um, so we've got a good group of folks here. I won't name everybody, but Cynthia, Ms. Cynthia is here with us. Um, <laughs> so these folks are the, now we have 14 folks and myself, so we had a team of 15 people all pushing at the wheel for energy justice, for housing justice, and then we're climate justice educators and advocates. So one of the best things that I can say to all of you right now is if you pull out your phone a minute, just quick pull out your phone a minute. I don't have time to tell you everything in this presentation. I do want to make this as interactive as possible. So I want to make sure to um, just say, if you went to our website, you could read, because I need two hours to explain this entire program to you. But if you went to c4collaboration.org, uh, I guess we should have put the figure somewhere. c4collaboration.org. And then later you can read about C4, connect with C4 if you want to send an email or anything like that. Our, our website does a very nice job of laying out our program. wwwc 4 uh, pardon me, c4collaboration.org. Um, a little bit about the training we use. We take our frontline communities and we bring them up to speed with the Google Workspace. It's an all free suite from Gmail to Google Meet to Google Chat to Google Calendar, Drive, Docs, Sheets, Slides, Forms, Sites. <laughs> if you can learn the Google Workspace suite of efficiency tools, you're, you can function at a professional level in any community. So this is one of the platforms we use to do our just soft skill training with our uh, frontline community. Our curriculum is based on um, Project Drawdown. If you want to, that's another website I highly encourage you to go to. It's Project Drawdown. They have a curriculum that's just six units. There's six videos, 15 minutes a piece. And in those six videos, you get you can get a PhD in climate justice. And what, what I like about this is you'll find the problem described all over the web very, very well. But almost no one's helping you with the solutions. And here we're going to get, they have hundreds of solutions from the individual to the municipality to a state to a government to the world. The solutions are there and they tell you that we don't need to invent some new machine. We don't need that. We have all of the solutions. It's about our political will, our, uh, our capital will. It's about all of that will that is necessary. Um, and then ultimately the last slide I think I'll show is this. This is our C4 leadership team. So the the thing about our Seymour leadership team is we take historical white organizations that are doing the work because you want to catch people up to speed. So Wendy Randall, for example, she's um, on the Essential Needs Task Force, um, operates out of the Heart of West Michigan United Way, connected to Kent County. It's a, it's a county program. So she's kind of an expert in the field for us. And we have Allison Sutter. She is the, in the Office of Sustainability with the City of Grand Rapids. Literally a PhD in climatology and justice and all that kind of stuff. U.S. Green Building Council. We've got um, 
Ferris State University and Kendall College of Art and Design. We've got Downtown GR Incorporated. We've got Wimiac. So we have a lot of the big players in the environmental field. And then they partnered with this BIPOC group of board members who maybe, for example, you know, um, uh, some of this is kind of a guy like Kareem coming out of the NAACP didn't have a big background in the climate. But now C4 has brought him up to speed. And what we find is there's this incredible intersection of justice issues that climate justice and environmental justice, uh, think lead paint. Um, environmental justice is the built environment. So, Grand Rapids, of course, 49507, we have one of the worst lead towns in the, in the state. Yes. And uh, uh, after COVID, for whatever reason, there was a 40% uh, spike in lead poisoning mm -hmm. in the last two years in Grand Rapids. And come to find out, all it was was COVID, forced everybody to stay inside, mm -hmm. and it's your own home that's toxifying. Mm -hmm. um, it's lead paint dust. Here in Grand Rapids, lead comes through lead paint dust. Many people think, oh, lead, it's in the water, Flint, Ben Harbor, you know, these crises. That's a different crisis. They actually have uh, both crises, but we don't have lead in our water, we got lead in our paint dust. So all of these individuals bring everybody up to speed, and then we work hard at uh, bringing justice. And these are the various organizations that they all come from. So each person, we have somebody from Kendall, somebody from Bethany, somebody from the Urban Core Collective. So each individual also has an entire team behind them. So the 35 people in C4 are bolstered by how big their organization is. So it's really quite an influential uh, movement in this, this long reach. Um, last, you know, I'll, I'll hear a good picture of Hillary Skull. She was here today. <laughs> we've, uh, we've done a lot of work with um, political advocacy. We're a community-based organization, so we're not bound by C3 rules that you can't advocate or lobby or any of this thing. Even though we're doing probably we qualify as lobby. But we've sat down with all of the major politicians in our district. So um, Hillary Skolton at the national level, Winnie Brink at the state level, she's the second majority leader. Uh, sat with um, Christian Grant, uh, our state representative, and then we've done quite a bit with all of the commission, county commissioners and uh, um, city commissioners as well. So C4 is just really, it was so wonderfully crafted in academia and so beautifully implemented in the implementation phase and then handed over a year and a half later. It's really a BIPOC organization, could be standalone, serve without any of these other high powered people involved anymore. And it's really been a beautiful transition of taking the people that we want to say are at the, at the bottom or at the margin of society, we flip the whole pyramid, we put them on top of the pile, we center them. They're the most important people. If we can develop these people, they can bring justice to all of us. So that's, that's a good bit of what we do. I, don't, I can go a lot of different directions. I want to open up for a conversation I also want to give Cynthia a chance to share too. Um, in fact, why don't we do that first? Just, just Cynthia, you want to come up? Here, I got time. Um, Cynthia is one of our community ambassadors. So I'm just, well, Cynthia, what is C4 from your perspective? Good afternoon, everyone. I pass by this church all the time because I'm a frequent flyer at the library. <laughs> and I don't think I've stopped long enough to read the sign. It's her. When I, I give you a little bit of my background, I have, this is my third state. I grew up in this inner city of Chicago in the projects. Then I moved to the west side. We were supposed to do it differently, grow up on the west side and move up to the south side, but we didn't know we did it opposite. And Dylan, I was there during the Mayor Daly regime, which was very good. He was very good on getting the voters out. We had the precinct captains. My mother is, came from the south. I am one of the first generation people from the south. So, it was a connection. She grew up in Birmingham during the Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. My mother did not teach me racism. She taught me to deal with each person individually and don't bring out that broad paintbrush of you all will like that. I've had that so many times that I've had people say to me, oh, you're different. How am I different? I'm only different because you were indoctrinated that I'm different. We're all the same. 
I, my educational background, I'm an ex, x-ray technician. I trained at Cook County Hospital in Chicago. I got married and I went to the other place, San Francisco General Hospital. If I haven't seen it, it hasn't happened. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at all of the aspects of, in each state, racism was, was the same. It just had a different angle. And when you walk in a room, you are already classified. If you don't tell somebody your background, I don't know any of your backgrounds to say, oh, this one is a Jew, this one is uh, Asian, this is, no. It's each person individually. When I came here to Grand Rapids, I was working at, I worked at a bank, I got, had a lot of different backgrounds. When I came here to Grand Rapids, it was a refreshment for me because of, I was in the big cities and Grand Rapids was, for me, Mayberry. <laughs> <laughs> My mom moved here with the grandchildren because the city of Chicago was getting dangerous for the young ones. They couldn't even go to the corner store without the gangs trying to bring them into it. And my mother moved here. It really saved her life because she was almost bedridden. And when we moved here, she was walking past here going downtown to the Calder walking with her grandchildren and stuff. So Grand Rapids has been uh, to, uh, was it Roberto Clemente that said, uh, baseball has been very, very good to me. <laughs> Grand Rapids has been very, very good to my family and myself in a lot of respects. Now, how did I get into C4? I, I'll make a confession, I am Catholic. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those rare black Catholics. <laughs> and so I was, I, I'm also a, um, my religious background, I am a Carmelite, um, tertiary, a third order Carmelite. And there's no Carmelite action in this area, so I am a Dominican associate. So I keep active in my faith. I was on the Dominican Climate Justice Program years ago, and then we had COVID. So during COVID, I was able to go through the Al Gore Climate Leadership Corps. And I went through that, and it says, now you gotta get involved with an organization. So I got involved in an organization. I wound up in, um, meetings that I don't even know how I got there. <laughs> so when I started out, I was with the Grand Rapids Resolution Coalition. They got together to write a, a resolution for the city to declare that climate change is an emergency. Not was, is. If you don't accept it, then you're not facing reality. It's everywhere. And it's in any type of area you want to look at. Is it water? Is it air? Is it food? Is it housing? It's, you can go on and on and on. It covers every single thing. So I was on with the Grand Rapids Resolution Coalition and I wound up on the education part of helping to write the resolution. Well, I brought in the big heavy. I went to the Dominicans. <laughs> and I brought in Sister Bridget, who practically wrote <laughs> the resolution. <laughs> anyway, the city says, oh, we don't do resolutions, but we kept their foot to the fire, and they wrote their own resolution, so now we're holding their feet to their resolution, which it wouldn't have been at all if we had not kind of pushed them. So anyway, what happened after that 
coalition only had maybe about five members in it when I first started. We are over, is it 85 or 90 now? That has, it's, it's growing, it's growing. Now, in one of those meetings, this man started talking about C4. And he said, we're looking to hire. I'm thinking, why not? And that's how I got here today. I have learned so much. And what I have learned is people care. You really care. And that's the beauty of it. That you're taking time out of your Sunday where you could either be at home, all snuggled up while it's rainy out, not to mention the football games, the gymnastics, I mean, so this is really great to see everybody here. And C4 has strengthened me to get out and talk to people. I don't argue. If I know, if I say pink and you say blue, that's fine. If you say red and I say yellow, that's fine. Because I don't want anybody trying to demand that I change. All we can do is give you the information and let you decide because ignorance is not bliss. Mm -hmm. Educate yourself in everything you do because ignorance is no excuse of the law. If you do something wrong, they'll tell you you're at it. See, before we get out and we meet with all of our community people, and that has strengthened us, it has brought people together, it has brought us to places like this to let you know we, C4, are here. We exist, and we would like for you to do whatever it is you feel inclined to do to help us, to spread the word, let people know, like the other one about the land thing, who you talk to, come to C4. We'll be at your door. <laughs> Thank you. Theological arguments. <laughs> <laughs> I have just a question about your your funding, what that's used for, and I only dealt with like five hundred one c three organizations, and so I'm just curious about how that that works in your, yeah. your controls and all that. Sure. So when you this is common practice when there's a um, community based organization, they seek a fiduciary. Because a foundation cannot give money to you or me as an individual, nor can they give it to just any organization. <coughs> They're bound by law only to give it to 501c not-for-profit organizations. So C4 partnered with Michigan Black Expo, and we also partnered with the Hispanic Center of West Michigan, and we took our grant dollars, half went to uh, Michigan Black Expo, and the other half went to the Hispanic Center. So they hold the dollars for us, process our expenditures and all of these kind of things. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm curious, um, how would you answer the question of how the blacks, indigenous, and people of color are disproportionately affected by climate change? Yeah, um, so what, what you have is this confluence of all these sectors of society that come to play. For example, take the histories of redlining. So, um, Black folks are often, take uh, Jackson, Mississippi, when the red folks are red line down the low lane line laying down by the river. So now you've moved them into the oldest housing stack, low line. Climate change is changing weather so that storms are bigger um, and they can have more intensity. So like here in Michigan, if you were, saw we have a drought this spring, instead of regular steady rainfall, we get six weeks of drought, no rain at all. Then two storms will roll through and bring you all the same amount of water that you should have gotten steadily over six weeks, but you got it in two storms. Well, when the ground goes hard, it can absorb moisture, and so you get more runoff. And so what climate change will do in Mississippi is deliver a flood that now comes through and wipes all these houses in low-lying land, which was where all the black and brown people were 
redlined into. And so there's this, um, you know, just the invisible hand of um, Adam Smith's economy, capitalism, will just move people around. So if you went to Detroit, uh, we were just driving through there yesterday, my buddy and I, um, there's uh, oil, I mean, the Marathon major oil refinery here, there's a major steel production plant here for the automotive industry, and then they have some other um, plant factory, I don't know what it was. But this is one of the most polluted neighborhoods in all of Michigan. And guess who lives there? Black and brown folks who are poor. And so we say it's disproportionate because the people who did the least to contribute to the problem don't own factories, not dump millions of metric tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, um, even their consumption level is very small, their footprint, you know, own five big vehicles and a yacht and a third home, uh, you know, they, they contribute to the least to climate change. If they get hit first, and they get hit worse. And we could extend that to the elderly. So when Cynthia comes out as one of our elderly representatives on a fixed income, climate change, what's the difference? She owns her own home, paid for it, all is good, right? Until the electric bill keeps going up and up and up, and the gas bill keeps going up and up and up. If you're just keeping up with that, you're in the water, you got your chin out, you're okay, and then a robot comes alongside, and then somebody says, hey, we're gonna, um, you know, <clears throat> add this one extra thing. Grand Rapids is booming. Let's uh, raise property taxes just three, four hundred dollars a year. And now you're pouring water into this person's mouth, which treading water, and they're going under. And they tend to be the people who can afford it at least. Yeah. Those kind of things. Um, what else? Other conversations? Um, one reason that I said that anyone might have a theological argument is because there are some folks who would say that um, Western Christianity itself is plays a factor in this whole thing. Yes. In that when you look at the Garden of Eden and then God says to Adam, he, he says to Adam, he gives him dominion over the land, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and the lands of the uh, animals of the land. And this concept of dominion, if you're careful with it, you can really, it's stewardship, it's about taking care of it and all that kind of thing. <clears throat> Many have run on a kind of a prosperity gospel thing. Hey, he's giving us dominion. You know, when you get to a forested area, you cut down every tree, you sell that lumber, and you make that money because God's given us dominion over the land. It's here for us, it's resources provided. <coughs> and that juxtaposition against Native American worldview, where they said, hey, every living thing has value. You don't cut down that tree, it's a living creature. We live in harmony with it. It cares for us, it provides shade and nuts and habitat for animals that we eat, squirrels and whatever, and, and we're going to live in harmony with this thing. So, these, these different worldviews, you know, theology even comes to play in climate change and climate justice and fighting this uh, worldwide phenomenon. Any other uh, points of conversation? I don't know what time we're at, if we're right around the right time. Any more questions? Anyone have any? The last few minutes we have? Any comments? I didn't see any faith like affiliated groups on that list. Um, uh, Bethany like, Christian Services oh, is on there. Um, I think that we have room for faith-based organizations, mm -hmm. but when we sought leadership team directors, we didn't land any other than uh, Dilly Gautama from uh, Bethany. Um, and we are a collaborator, so C4 Community Collaboration. You know, West Michigan Forward, uh, uh, we, you know, West Michigan together. Yeah, together West Michigan, yeah, West Michigan. Yeah. pardon me. We have quite a bit of connections into that. And so we, we see the faith community. We've been to a lot of churches. A lot of churches have reached out. If someone wants to get involved with C4, how do they go about doing that? On that website that I gave you earlier, I'd go to www.c4collaboration.org. There's a spot where you can connect or contact. And then I would send an email to me. And then I would say, hey, what can we do? Because we're always looking for people to bring justice issues forward. Hey, there's a, Park and Lab over here that's been sitting for 40 years, it should be peeled up, you know, or um, there's a large group of unhoused people here that need some help, what can we do? So we're, we're always trying to wade into those issues because imagine being unhoused. Imagine the next summer when it hits 95 degrees for three weeks in a row and you're unhoused. Have you seen the folks in Little Lady that was going to her mailbox in Arizona and she stumbled and fell on the side <coughs> and lay there for five minutes until her neighbor came and helped her out? Second degree burns all up and down the mountain because the concrete or the asphalt.
model over there, right? 115 air temperature, it feels like, but it's kind of, it was 140 degrees. Those old commercials where it's so hot, you can cook an egg on the sidewalk. Well, watch out. All over the U.S., you can cook people on the sidewalk. They fall asleep at night, um, or they fall asleep drunk, or they're, it's real trouble for uh, the other house. Mm -hmm. I do want to say one thing. A lot of people are afraid to get involved with climate change. Because they know it's a hot button that some people will get aggravated and nasty about it. They don't agree. I'm suggesting everybody do just one thing. Don't overburden yourself. Do one thing this month. Do another thing next month. At the end of the year, you've done 12 things. Stop using straws. Recycle. Try not to use so much plastic. We're not asking you to be scully and go and save a plane on the Hudson. <laughs> a lot of people don't want to get involved with it because it's so voluminous. What we're saying is each individual, each one of you, do one thing. And then collectively, I, we'd encourage churches to um, improve your efficiency. So if you haven't switched out all your incandescent bulbs and all the LED, you're making a mistake. One, you can save money. Two, you consume less energy. Um, insulation, you can take the facility and, and, and weatherize it. We pushed a lot of churches to consider land use because now you guys don't have this necessarily, but a lot of churches had this building sitting in the middle of an incredible lawn scape. And we've said, hey, can you unlock an unlock movement? Can you grow food? What if the neighbors put a community garden on your property? What if you start putting urban forests onto your property? So one of our projects is uh, we're in connection with uh, Boston Square Community Church, um, and we're building a pocket forest at this church here. So Boston Square, this is Kalamazoo headed north, Van Eck Burton, you're coming this way. There used to be a parsonage that sat right here amidst these beautiful old growth oak trees. But you, you go from 70 foot canopy down blue, uh, Kentucky bluegrass. So we came to this church and said, hey, you know, you could really activate that space as a community place. Um, you could support the health of these existing trees, trees grow in communities. And we come in and put some, uh, can we plant some mid-level trees in there for you? As well as peel back right now, we're just working on a section over here. We're gonna peel out all the Kentucky bluegrass, make it native species, a little sidewalk that runs through there. There'll be a park bench, a little place for people to sit in nature in the middle of the city. And we're gonna plant um, all, these are uh, a white oak and then these are all red oaks. So for every tree that you see there, we need a, another tree to replace it when it comes down. So. You gotta plant trees today, not tomorrow, today. So we're doing projects like that. Churches all over Grand Rapids could really impact urban heat islands and other effects by planting and managing the property. Not but I see we've run out of time, so. Yard. If you do your own homes, uh, mm -hmm. just start a little spot. And the plants <clears throat> that you get at the nurseries here, are not necessary native. Mm -hmm. So I think if each one of us might start when we go, start asking where we shop. Stop using the liquid laundry. There is, you know, uh, laundry sheets that's out there. Meyer sells them now. Look for the ecological products. Ask about the fair trade, the things that you're buying from other places that are using <coughs> child labor. Uh, just just be a little bit more involved and ask questions. People are willing if they know about it. If they don't know about it and you bring it to them, they'll go, thanks for bringing us this information. So each one of us has the power to do something. And the, the smaller the better because they all add up and the quicker. That's right. And so we've run out of time here. And you really can't grasp C4 in an hour's conversation. You need to go to that website. You need to maybe go to an event. You might see if you if you connect with us, it basically will get you on the email list, and then you'll find out where our next event is. You can start finding out how you can plug in. Um, privileged communities, we often say one of the great things you could do is adapt someone on the front line. You know, help bring someone else, uh, help bring someone else along so that 
you can support people that are in a place of privilege. And we're all doing our part. So thank you very much for having me.